Over the last few days, maybe weeks, maybe even years, you've heard about all these schools that have been shut. And these problems are all stemming from concrete, which has essentially been made like pumice. As you'll see, that's the floats from water. It's pretty amazing for a piece of concrete. Why could this be a potential problem that that sinks and that floats? If you keep the rack nice and dry, then you're fine. But if you let water get to it, it can soak up the water and if that water gets to the reinforcement that's inside it can corrode the reinforcement and make it rusty. But I think there's a deeper problem with our education system and government. So it is survival of the fittest! It, it's just a childish wish list. You that. choose to sacrifice tens of thousands of disabled people. Why do we have to wait until there's a crisis in our schools before we properly fund them? It, it's just a childish wish list. We weren't just saying there's a significant risk uh, of fatality, we were saying there's a critical risk to life. It, it's just a childish wish list. And it might be reasonable to suggest that I'm exaggerating, but have a listen to this. I don't support the Human Rights Act, and I don't believe in economic and social rights. It's not just Rob that's saying this, there are others. And a lot of these thoughts and theories seem to stem straight out of colonial British imperial history. But before we go into that, let's have a listen to the car crash interviews that took place with both the schools minister and the Education Secretary. You've said now 156 schools have been identified as having a problem. So let's just have a think about those maths. He said 156 schools. And on average, each school has between 800 and about 1,000 students. So let's go for the lower number. That's 800 students. So 800 times 156 is 124,000 students, potentially under the roofs of rack. But of course, they're not going to tell you that little secret. Have a listen to what they actually say instead. It's only 1%. The vast majority do not have rack. But we... And most of that is, is in, you know, in areas that it's not really a danger right. at all. There's not many of them. The vast majority, there's no suspected rack. 124,000, according to them, isn't a significant number. When the story was breaking, they sent out this gimboid, Nick Gibb, He's the schools minister, and he had a bit of a car crash interview. In March, our correspondent, Daniel Hewitt, had a Freedom of Information request which showed there were 1,466 schools built in the period, which means that they might be at risk of having that concrete in them. Can you tell us, have you been through all of those 1,466 schools I'm not going to play you everything that Nick says, but essentially he goes on to suggest that they wrote to all the schools, asked them to inspect, and then when they realised there was a bigger problem, they sent in surveyors. However, what he doesn't do, he doesn't answer the question. But you don't know the answer to my question, do you? Yes, well, look... There are the schools you don't know. You don't... You, look, there are I schools totally... which might be at risk and you don't know. That's a separate issue about whether essentially we're collecting the information. Except that's the exact question that Ed asks. It's almost like going to someone and saying, can you tell me the time? And they tell you about the weather. Since March 2022, we decided uh, above, you know, anything else done anywhere else in the world, that we wanted to have that information centralised. And 95% of responsible bodies responded to that questionnaire. Even though the responsible bodies, local authorities, trust, you know as a former education secretary, that they are responsible ultimately legally Gibb, for the school building. We wanted to go a centrally stage you further gave, than was necessary so that we understood the risks. Centrally, you gave us the information in March, the list of schools, in the Freedom of Information request, six months on, centrally, you still don't know whether all those schools have got a problem or not. This is going to go from bad to worse because we're going to have a civil servant turn up who says we were giving them advice as far back as 2017. And it definitely got worse for Mr Gibb. And just, just to establish, that 5%, how many schools does that cover, that 5%? That you don't well, I'm know. not entirely clear what, what that number equals, but what, what we do know is that... As you said 5%, how many schools is 5%? Well, there are different estimates of how many. The, the responsible bodies know the number of schools in their... In their You're the uh, schools it, that they're minister. Responsible for. It's in your name, Mr Gibb. How many schools are in the 5% that you don't yet know? Well, look, as I said, I, I've given you the information... It's hundreds or thousands? It, it, it will be. If you, look at the, if you think about the, 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 the 15,000 or more... Lots of stuttering, lots of stumbling, stress, stress, stress. 5% is about 1,000 schools, just It will be only 1%, if that, that, where RAC is identified. Okay, so We're that's, talking that's... about a very small number 
uh, still to be identified. One percent is about another two hundred schools. I think. It, well, we, we don't know for certain, but it, it, yeah. it could be. In, but, it between could be. two hundred and a thousand extra schools over that, over the one hundred and fifty-six. 156 plus 200 to 1,000 schools more. Well, uh, you're coming up with numbers out well, of... Well, I'm, just, I'm just listening. In there. When like you to, say 5%, I'm just like listening to, to you. Evidence. So, after that complete and utter disaster, they sent out the education secretary the next day to try and steady the ship. And it goes from bad to worse. Is there a list which you have received in advice from civil servants with the names of schools which you have so far not publicly revealed to parents? We have the responsible bodies that are still got to complete for some schools sure. and we've chased them up. I also uh, put in place a call centre to phone them up and say, you need to fill this questionnaire which is, which is, It I'm is asking, their job, by the a, way, to do this. I'm asking you a so, very precise question, though. Have you received advice from civil servants in your department in the last six months with a list of schools which, are fiscal, which officials fear may be at risk which you have chosen not to reveal so far? No, no, no. We have a list of responsible bodies who have to detail each of the schools with the survey coming back. So you've now, not ever them... had a list of schools? Getting an answer to this straightforward question is going to be like pulling out teeth. We have a list of 156 schools... But I'm talking about the which schools which might be, be at risk, which aren't on the list. Um, no, we have the responsible bodies, of so the 90% that Hewitt have any... quoted 1,500 schools in the freedom of information request he had, you've never asked for the list of those schools, you've never received that list of potentially 1,500 or more schools, and you've never acted to tell parents that their children may be in one of those schools which could be at risk. Why do I get the impression from that face she is looking down at them for even coming and questioning her about this. All of this advice, by the way, in terms of critical and non-critical, only changed at the end of August. I mean, there's been warnings on rack. Indeed, when you were Education Secretary, you were told to check all the roofs by the... She's blaming Ed from 13 years ago. Maybe she has a point. Maybe the Labour government failed. But it wasn't until 2017 that the rack started to collapse inside schools. Ed wasn't in charge at that point. So there's been a lot of requests for this. We have taken it. In. As you know, Ed, the responsible bodies are responsible for building safety. What we've done is go above and beyond. For the first time, we're probably the government that has got more detail of rack in their schools than any other government, and certainly than uh, the, the Welsh uh, government and the, and the Scottish government. Of course, she had to put in a little dig against the Welsh and Scottish governments, and the Welsh government has come out and said they've not been made aware of any of this despite the fact this concrete was being used across the country during the same period for the same public buildings. In March, we reported, on the basis of an FOI request, that there were 1,500-plus schools which might be at risk, where you didn't have the information, but they were worried because of mm -hmm. the period in which they were built. Why didn't you, one, in the period between March and August, go to those individual schools and ask them that question? We have. But, but, but secondly, we, we have. what... You have done. We've well, been, we've so you been, did have a list of those schools. Going, so you we've did been have a going list of those through schools. the responsible bodies to say, give no, us a list of all the schools. Look, I'm the sec uh, I was the Secretary of State. You're yes. the Secretary of State. You know, you don't have to go to the responsible bodies. You can go direct to the schools. If you fear that children are at risk in a school, you can go directly to those 1,500 head teachers and ask them the question. And what I don't understand is why didn't you we've go to those... We've made it very clear to head teachers. We've put it out in many, many channels. So you have been to the 1,500 schools? That this questionnaire is due. In some cases now, we've just sent surveyors in. Um, you know, the responsibility is here is of the responsible bodies. On that list. They have to act on the list. I mean, the reality oh. is we have given them the questionnaire, we've given them the surveyors. All we need to do is get the response. Again, it's shifting of responsibility. And this is what she was caught saying off camera. She blamed the schools. Does anyone ever say, you know what, you've done a f good job because everyone else has sat on their ass and done nothing. No, no, no signs of that, no? At the end of the day, those schools were constructed by government. It's their responsibility to maintain those buildings and make sure that they're safe for all children. To essentially be an inspector, to ensure safety standards are kept at a high level. And she's done nothing. And it's not even as far back as March. We can go even further. And of course... It gets worse. We asked you in March to come on our programme and tell us about this list, and you wouldn't come on. 
the response, well, I, I, to be honest, I did, I, I, as I say, I come on to, to anybody. It was later claimed by several newspapers that Gillian Keegan, the person you were just listening to, had said this. We just need to keep the lid on this for two years, and then it's someone else's problem. It was an anonymous source leaked to East Anglia Byline Times. But you sort of think to yourself, that can't be true, no one could say that. However, another civil servant came to the forefront to the BBC. And because of a collapse in 2017, the National Audit Office actually wrote a report for June 2019 stating, Following years of underinvestment, the estate's overall condition is declining, and around 700,000 pupils are learning in a school that the responsible body or DFE believes needs major rebuilding or refurbishment. And there's this account. To be clear, the Department for Education goes to the Treasury and say, we need money to rebuild 300 to 400 schools a year, and you got what? So while I was the Permanent Secretary, we got the funding to replace about 100 schools per year. A third or a quarter of what you'd asked for? Absolutely. What was your reaction when you were told that? So it's frustrating, of course, um, uh, when for you the most important thing is the uh, priority to be given to safety, uh, if the Treasury, of course, have got a concern that there's never enough money for everything... It, it's just a childish wish list. You stuff. choose to sacrifice tens of thousands of disabled people. But we were able to present them with really good data. We weren't just saying there's a significant risk uh, of fatality. We were saying there's a critical risk to life if this programme is not funded. While I was the Permanent Secretary in 2018, a concrete block fell from the roof of a primary school. So it wasn't just a risk, it was actually starting to happen. This spending review was completed a year after I left the department, and I was absolutely amazed uh, to see that the decision made by the government was to halve the, com uh, the school rebuilding programme, so down from 100 a year to 50 a year. And it would appear that Rishi wasn't really briefed on any of this, that Keegan had gone off and done her own thing. And it meant that Rishi came out trying to say that 50 schools a year was a good thing. Actually, one of the first things I did as Chancellor in my first spending review in 2020 was to announce a new 10-year school rebuilding programme for 500 schools. Now, that equates to about 50 schools a year that will be refurbished or rebuilt. But it got worse. I revealed in the last hour that Rishi Sunak said 50 schools a year would be rebuilt under his programme, which began two years ago. How many have been completed? Just four. Are you to blame for what's happening now? Do you want to apologise to parents and pupils? No, I think that is completely and utterly wrong. Say it is survival of the fittest! Now I keep playing that clip, survival of the fittest, because the more I look into this, the more I start to get the impression from what these MPs from the Tory party are saying is that they have some sort of neo-social Darwinism. And I'm not talking about this clip from the movie 300. I'm talking about more of a soft version of this. You survive in capitalism or you disappear in capitalism. And I even have evidence to back it up. We have to drag this back to 2010 when Michael Gove was the education secretary and he scrapped Labour's plans to do a huge rebuild project with the schools. In fact, it went further and in a year he was taken to court and the judge accused Gove of abusing his power. But of course, Gove still went ahead and scrapped the rebuilding project. The connection to Neil's social Darwinism comes from a leaked file from Gove's advisor at the time, Dominic Cummings. The document goes on to suggest that genetics isn't taken seriously enough and that actually genetics outweighs teaching. But that on its own isn't enough and some scientists even argue that that interpretation is not fair. Well, how about Dominic Cummings' father-in-law stating this? To be elitist, I think the quality um, climbs up the tree of life and therefore, in general, high beings in the tree of life have quality, have skills, and they get wonderful degrees at university, and they, if they marry in each other, that gets them better again. That's right. You've just heard something that's remnant from the eugenics theories of the 1900s. And that's Cummings' father-in-law, and he's written a paper on that, and he's passed it over to Gove. And the only reason we know about it is not because Gove fired him, in fact, Cummings gets promoted, it's because it got leaked. This outlook, this pseudoscience, comes from the days of the British Empire, where essentially 
The British had to come up with mental inventions to justify the work and the damage and the deaths and the killing that they were doing in order to control a third of the world. They started using science to grade different human beings and eventually putting Europeans at the top of the pile. This new colonizing story was the most sophisticated and tantalizing yet, and it's one that's still kind of embedded in a lot of our brains still. Essentially stating it was their role to bring civilization to the world. And they would use Darwin and his origin of species as the basis because it showed there was a hierarchical system within plants, animals, and humans. This is Cecil Rhodes, and he seems to think, We happen to be the best people in the world with the highest ideals of decency and justice, liberty and peace, and the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for humanity. This is all being said during the backdrop of some of Charles Dickens' most prolific novels, including that of Oliver Twist. And what does Michael Gove think of this era to bring it full circle? For some of us, Victorian costume dramas are not merely agreeable ways to while away Sunday evening, but enactments of our inner fantasies. I don't think there has been a better time in our history. And when you listen around to other news outlets, you start to hear the same stuff. We, we respect, yeah, we, we respect. What was rural Africa like before the Brits turned up? I mean, it was a bustling metropolis, was it? This elitism has even left the lips of prime ministers, who wrote this in The Spectator in 2002. The continent may be a blot, but it is not a blot upon our conscience. The problem is not that we were once in charge, but that we are not in charge anymore. And if you think the Prime Minister's exempt, he's keen for people not to go to university, and this is what he said. They're full of people who don't vote for us anyway. So you wouldn't have minded if one of your children had met someone from a lower socio-economic group who was intelligent and talented and... Intelligent and talented is lovely, but I want parents and grandparents who've had hands-on success running their battles well and proving they're wonderful because one is the subject of one's genes and I, th I think I like the idea of them being successful genes. I have friends who are aristocrats, I have friends who are upper class, I have friends who are you know working class but I'm not working class. Just to emphasise this point further, this is Sir Isaac Newton. His parents were farmers. This is Michael Faraday. He was born into a poor family and his parents were not academics. This is George Stevenson. His father was a fireman at the coal mine. He's the inventor of railways. Alan Turing's parents worked in the Indian Civil Service. He invented the computer. Stephen Hawking's grandparents were farmers. Einstein's grandparents were textile merchants and grain dealers. All this leads me to think is that these idiots are following a pseudoscience left over from the colonial days of the British Empire, and that they're, they're willing to sacrifice your children, the disabled, and anyone else that they deem inferior, all for a pseudoscience ideology. You choose to sacrifice tens of thousands of disabled people. Thank you to all of my Patreon and YouTube supporters. You're awesome. For everyone else, please click that like and subscribe button. And also let me know in the comments, am I overthinking this or am I on the money?